won't work against their own interests. Like working under the leadership of black people is against their own interests, but they work under the leadership of white people all the time. So what's wrong, what's right about white people working under the leadership of white people, but what's wrong about them working under the leadership of black people? That's a hell of a communist that I'm talking to. That ain't my friend. Uh, and, and this is a severe limitation of the left in this country. Let me say this. I think it's really important to understand that the, the slavery and communism uh, gave rise not only to the ruling class, to the bourgeoisie, it gave birth to the working class too. The working class, the white working class, and the white ruling class were born of the same process that's characterized as primitive accumulation. This is why the Marxists can say that capitalism was progressive in terms of the development of human society. Because it was progressive as it relates to white people and white workers. So here you have white people who were trapped under feudal tyranny. You know, Robin Hood, robbing the rich to give to the poor, running from their share from Nottingham, the whole bit. Living, uh, you know, just under near terroristic uh, existence. And then now what happens is, and they, this whole notion about having the, the how to go that uh, a man's home is his castle. Well, the only castle that Europeans knew when we met them was owned by the nobility, the lords, uh, the nobility. There was no castle. Was no didn't own anything. They was didn't even own their own homes and stuff. They were tied to the land that was owned by the land lords and the nobility. It was here. It was in Africa. It was in what they now call Australia. All these other places that gave homes to homeless white people. This is the first black people were getting the hell out of Europe and coming here in other places. And this is where you first find them being able to acquire homes. So you're talking about average working class, white working class, was given birth to by the same process that gave birth to the white ruling class. And that's why, in many instances, people say, well, we don't understand how the white workers always working against their own interests. They vote for Trump, they vote for this other policies, etc. Man, they voting, they're voting on the same team. They just got differences of opinion about how to acquire what they need. And so we have a situation where the crisis of imperialism results in many white people going to the Tea Party, going to Trump, and things like that. But at the same time, it gives rise to uh, Occupy Wall Street and all these other things because they've been quiet, they've been cut off. They've been cut off because they live in an economy that requires the ability to suck the blood of people around the world. People in Afghanistan say you can't suck my blood no more. People in Nicaragua and, 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 and Venezuela say you can't suck my blood anymore. And more and more people around the world are fighting to take back their resources, creating crisis and, and limitations on what's available uh, uh, in, in Europe and among European people. This is the economic crisis that we're looking at. And the problem is that the white left uh, has not been able to unite with the oppressed of the world. It's been self-serving white left. Whether it's called white women's movement, white homosexual movement, white what have you, it's a white rights movement. And the way that they say the road to socialism is painted black. And that uh, if you really want socialism and overturning the social system, or you just want a better deal on the capitalist system, that's the thing that we're really looking at. And that's why we see so many people call themselves communist, socialists, and leftists in the white community. They're looking for a better deal for themselves because it's real clear. We never heard the J. Edgar Hoover, who at the time was the director of the U.S. domestic secret political police say that the Communist Party of the USA was the greatest internal threat to the, to the U.S. since the Civil War. That was the Black Panther Party they said that about. And the Black Panther Party was comprised essentially of young Africans who living in housing projects and stuff like that, running around doing six anemia tests and free breakfast for school children programs. That, that's the greatest internal threat to the security of the United States since the Civil War. This is, where, this is where the revolution is. It is in the African communities, in the barrios, 
and things like that throughout this country. That's where the revolution is. That's where the drive for socialism is going to occur. And anybody who's interested in going to have to get on that bandwagon as opposed to coming into our communities telling us that in order for us to be free, we've got to find the right text, uh, the right quote uh, for Mark to live in or somebody else like that. And they have to show us the way. It doesn't work that way. Yeah. We passed out thousands of leaflets that said um, the role of the social movement is painting yeah. black. So yeah. why do we say the role of the social movement is painting black? We do say that, and, and it's true. And we say it because there, there are two social systems. That's, I don't think there's much dispute about that. And the social system that most of humanity is trapped in. And most of humanity uh, do not, does, does not have paid streets and the ability to go uh, uh, and turn on a faucet and get clean water. The vast majority of us are without those kinds of resources. And, uh, and it is upon our backs that the whole this system was born. That's, that's what we've just said. And in this country in particular, we're now uh, in occupied Mexico for lack of a better term. Uh, and uh, on this part of the U.S., uh, capitalism is consolidated through stealing these lands here and uh, the horrible aggression that was initiated against the people who were living here. We're talking about all the indigenous people. Some who call themselves Mexicans and, and others who do not, but who are indigenous people, people here. And, uh, and, but the capitalism was consolidated in this country and in the world through slavery and the slave trade. And uh, the biggest crisis that we've ever seen occur in the struggle against capitalism has been uh, African people rising up, the colonial subjects rising up. And we say that the destruction of capitalism, because that's what I'm talking about. And that's the thing that's very difficult for many white leftists to really unite with, even though they can say it in words, but it's something that might make them uncomfortable. The problem is that most white leftists I know, and white liberals I know, are more afraid of black people than they are of Trump, and than they are of the capitalist class itself. Uh, and, and there is got and the problem that we have in this country in terms of the struggle, and much of the world, I'm not just putting on white people here, because uh, when the Algerian Revolution happened, the people in, in North Africa who were fighting against French occupation and French colonialism, the French Communist Party refused to unite with the Algerian Revolution because they say Algeria was a part of France. <laughs> it was a province of France, and so how can they be fighting for independence? The Portuguese. During the time Africans were fighting against Portuguese colonialism in, in Africa, uh, said this is the Portuguese left, saying that if you really want to end colonialism in Africa, what you got to do is unite with the struggle of the Portuguese who are fighting against fascism in Portugal. Fortunately, you know, we had people like Amir Carlos who said, I don't know about that. He said, I know for sure, however, if we overturn colonialism in Portugal, fascism will come up in Africa. Country and most of the world. 
And uh, that's where the struggle for socialism was located in, in 65th and 69th Bill, uh, right here uh, in Oakland, California at the time. And that's what we were united with, and that's what, if, and the problem that they always had is the, is what they like, they used to like to refer to Africans and Mexicans and what have you, the, the Marxists and communists, uh, they talk about the national question and how to resolve the national question in order to get this communism, get this socialism. They talk about the national question, they talk about us. The real national question is white people. That's the problem that has to be solved for white people to abandon this relationship they have with their own bourgeoisie, their own whiteness and what have you, and unite with the leadership of the African working class, the African revolution. We get that ball on rolling well. And that's what we've been working with for a while. And I'm really proud to say that I, I think that we've, we've come to terms with that. I really think that we have solved that particular contradiction with the uh, creation of the African People's Solidarity um, uh, Committee uh, and the uh, Uhura Solidarity Movement that has uh, come in its way. I probably will talk, but go ahead, Governor. What do you think about the question of if it's socialism in just one country, and do you think that's even possible? It doesn't work, and this was, but most of the, most of the Marxists at one time <laughs> understood that that socialism one country, although the problem that they had was when they talked about one country, they were not including us in this assessment. They were talking, we were the uncivilized people. This is how we were most often characterized by Marxists for a long period of time. But uh, uh, even when the Bolshevik uh, revolution happened in, in uh, 1917, Russia, the first uh, <coughs> experiment, uh, could, could I have some more, please? The first uh, seizure, successful seizure of state power uh, by socialists, uh, uh, Lenin understood. In fact, many of the Bolsheviks, many of the people who were with Lenin, and Lenin, I say the Bolsheviks, they were the, the, the Communist uh, Party, the most effective Communist Party in Russia had split uh, into two. And one called themselves Bolsheviks, the majority, and the other the Mensheviks. Uh, and the, the Bolsheviks uh, were those who followed beyond Lenin. Uh, who uh, you know, was really determined uh, to make the revolution and challenge all of the cowardly acts of uh, uh, much of the other uh, sectors of the communist or socialist movement. Uh, but Lenin, so, so even members of the Bolsheviks who were with, who were part of Lenin's organization were opposed to the siege of power, so much so that two members of the Central Committee when they told the police that they're going to have this election in a couple of days. And actually, it was in the newspaper. They put it in the newspaper that the election is going to happen on such and such a day. Um, because they didn't believe that, 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 first of all, you could seize power like that. They believed that, first of all, Russia couldn't become a socialist country or a communist country, they said, because it had not developed well enough. It had not, uh, the maturation of this uh, economic development uh, didn't, wouldn't allow it. That it had to happen in a highly industrialized country. And Russia uh, was a semi feudal uh, state that has just begun to uh, engage in, in a meaningful way with countless production. And so they said, we can't take power, even though it's possible to take it. And so, one, and so they did take power. And then after they took power, Lenin was clear. He said that we cannot hold power unless revolution happens in Germany, which was the most highly developed uh, uh, industrial uh, country at, in Europe at the time. Unless it spreads throughout Europe, we will not be able to hold power, because you can't do it in one country. How are you going to have socialism in one country? How are you going to have an island of socialism in a sea of capitalist production and capitalist? You can't do that. And Cuba is a clear example of that with the, the courageous, brave Cuban Revolution. Not just Cuba, look at Vietnam. Made the most heroic struggle uh, against a uh, capitalist power that's maybe ever been made. You can't do that because uh, capitalism continues to exist and capitalism is the world economy. The capitalist system is the world economy and they squeeze and isolate and destroy. Look at what they're doing in Venezuela right now. That's right. And, and so, no, it doesn't happen that way. 
But it doesn't, we don't have to have it happen that way, because we can have a socialism uh, emerging on a global scale, because I think that's the era that we've entered into at this moment. Yeah. Chairman, you can talk about the defining portion of capitalism that is a pair of citizens. Can you explain what that means and why capitalism must be true? Well, I don't care what anybody says that the greatest crime in humanity was the slave trade and enslavement of Africa. <laughs> what I'm talking about the capture of an entire continent, 12 million square miles, and turning that continent, the entire continent, into a factory for the production of human beings who would be put under the worst kind of conditions imaginable. Sometimes Africans have a problem understanding white power and the system because we don't believe what it would do to us despite all the things that it has done to us. And we cannot, don't believe what it would do to us so often because it's hard to imagine any body doing the kinds of things to human beings, an entire <laughs> continent of people. We used to say that if it were possible to look beneath the Atlantic Ocean and the trip from Africa to here would be a highway of bones that bring in Africans from Africa to here. The sharks actually learn to follow ships, schools of sharks. They change the entire ecosystem of the ocean. Schools of sharks would follow the ships. And because they were going to be well fed. Because if an African got sick, throw the African will pull it because he don't want the others to catch it because they're going to lose money when we get there. Uh, African jumping off rather than being taken away. I mean, it was an incredible thing that was done to Africa and African people. And this is a part of the origin of this entity that we're talking about, this capitalist state that we're talking about. It's a horrible thing. Look at what it did to the indigenous people here. I mean, it's almost destroyed. I mean, it did destroy in certain places in what we now refer to as the Americas, which is a crime unto itself, uh, that whole peoples don't exist anymore as a consequence of what happened to give rise to capitalism. And it's not just that they did a bad thing a long time ago. The people are still catching hell where they do continue to exist. Look at, look at what happened to our Haiti. Well, the first successful workers' revolution on earth occurred. Well, the first successful slave rebellion occurred. Where, where this island of a handful full of people almost destroyed the whole capitalist economy. Because capitalist economy was based on what? Slavery. And the Haitian Revolution <laughs> destroyed France's ability to maintain slavery on that island. And then it said, the Haitians, the Africans there said that any slave on earth come to Haiti and you'll be free. We'll give you land, etc. This is the place that the first quarantine in this hemisphere, economic quarantine, was initiated against our people in Haiti. And this quarantine demanded that Africans in Haiti pay France reparations for lost property. And the lost property was us. And all of the white powers of the world, including the United States, and this had economic quarantine so that Haiti could not trade with anybody. And was starved them unless they paid France. And for almost a hundred years, they paid reparations to France for taking back our own freedom. Why can anybody support a social system born of this stuff and think that there's anything valuable about it? How can you even assume that you can build a system out of this process that has any redeeming qualities at all. It can't happen. And people who hold on to it, hold on to all of that history. 
they hold on to a history in this, on this land here, where they would come. The Europeans, uh, the conquistadores, and they would especially take 10-year-old girls and rape them. People were talking about more in, where is he from? Alabama? It's more, it was more from Alabama, South Carolina, something like that. South Carolina, I think it was from. You know, the guy who, uh, you know, the women said that uh, he molested them when they were teenagers and what have you. You know, the kick off the Me Too movement. And sisters have been saying, where the, where the hell have you been all these damn years? You know? Um, but this is what this is what this this capitalism has bred. And it can't do anything better than that. And more than that, uh, so the social system has to be overturned. There has to be a real transformation so that the people who do the producing also own it. If we do the work, damn it, then the product should be ours. It should be our social, it should be our social product. And that's what that's why we have to fight for. And the system right now, you see crisis everywhere in the social system. And to some people, they don't see the basis of the crisis. They just see perennial warfare. Looks like the war would never stop. How long? Afghanistan, what, 16, 17 years in Afghanistan. Here you got people, you know, barely able to get bread for their children. Who are having to face drone attacks. And I'm not just, I'm not talking about Trump, I'm talking about Obama. I'm talking about the U.S. Trump. All of them killing babies and what have you. Uh, and, and, and if they're not, and they are there, they're in Iraq. They're fighting Iran. They're making struggles against all the peoples around the world who are trying to resist them. Because people don't want to live like this no more. People are determined not to live like this anymore. People are determined that their product, their land, their rape, and what they produce should feed their own children. And they know that somebody's opening a refrigerator in Manhattan right now that's filled with the milk that their baby should be fed. That's the reality of the whole world. You know, and if you go and uh, how many people in this in this room? Can you show your hands who, who travel in Africa? You go uh, to Africa. Which, in terms of natural resources, is probably the richest place on the planet. Where it's even hard to describe the amount of looting that happens in Africa every day. I mean, I've been in places in Africa where, where trains carrying loads of oil run all day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, from the ship. To the mines, from the mines to the ship, every day, all day. And in this place that I'm talking about, that produces some of the best diamonds in the world, you go to your mall, you get those diamonds there, where the people who get those diamonds make something like 32 cents a day in a cup of ice. Why <laughs> does capitalism have to fall? <clears throat> yes. And when I look at my community, and our people, and I look at the contradiction that's been created between the peoples of the world because of this foul social system. It's an easy answer for me. Capitalism has to die. It has to die. Donald Trump can live to be as old as a mythological Methuselah for all I care. But capitalism has to die. <laughs> capitalism has to die. Yeah. Yeah. You were the first to define the assassination of Malcolm X and Martin Luther King and others as common insurgency. Nobody else talks about it in terms of the African community inside the U.S. Can you talk about that? Yeah, that's true. I mean, this is a real contradiction. We fought this and tried to help people understand this. Um, that what we were looking at, and that's really important, uh, was a counterinsurgency. You know what a counterinsurgency is? A counterinsurgency is a comprehensive 
program to keep a subjugated people from rising up or to push them back into subjugation. That's what counterinsurgency is there. And it, it is something that has been perfected over numbers of years by Europe, by different powers in Europe, and is employed uh, against anybody who it uses psychological warfare, it uses uh, economic warfare, uh, every form of warfare, of course, and the fundamental component, the base is military. It always was military. And, and uh, its primary uh, uh, methodology uh, involves population and resource control. <clears throat> and I've, I've lived in Oakland, and East Oakland was just my joint. You know, I lived in Oakland and uh, developed some of the best habits I've got that were acquired right here in Oakland, California. Um, and we saw a situation where at one time, is, uh, and this is what we were fighting in Oakland, we waged incredible struggles in Oakland. <clears throat> the high tide of black resistance in this city happened under the leadership of the rule of movement. Yes. It was <clears throat> we uh, who fought against what you see happening now with all these tents. <clears throat> we fought them tooth and nail. We put a measure on the ballot uh, called Measure O. Uh, because we saw in the city of Oakland, in East Oakland alone, uh, I think something like 64% of all of the residential rental property were owned by white people who didn't live there. And more than 80% of all of the commercial rental property were owned by white people who didn't live in Oakland. In East Oakland, this is East Oakland, now, we, used to, we used to be able to quote the actual amount of billions of dollars that were leaving Oakland annually. And, and uh, so here we are in Oakland, and I'm seeing homeless people, people are sleeping in Lafayette Park. They used to call it Old Man Park. After sleeping in the bushes and whatever. This is Panther country. This is the country where Africa stood higher than any place. And now, and, and this is why we had to be subjugated so deeply in, uh, here, in this city. Uh, and uh, we kicked off a whole movement around the question of housing that was fought by everybody, including the Communist Party, Angela Davis, uh, Black Preachers Association, Black Law Enforcement Association, all of them in together to keep this measure that we put on the ballot. The measure that we put on the ballot was one that would take the abandoned houses throughout the communities and turn them over to community control of housing boards. And in, I think it may have been 12 distinct communities based on economics, on the amount of money, earned money in those communities. And the only people who could be on the community control of housing boards were tenants, and homeowners, and no one who owned more than four units could be on that board. And that board, uh, and it, it made, it said that the law would require that no rent be more than 25% of a person's income. There was a place in West Oakland where 97% of the people were on welfare. You think about that, where the rent could be no higher than 25% of the income in that community. Another impoverished community. So if you live in a rich community, you pay rich money. But even that is only 25% of the income, right? And that any house that had been abandoned for more than four months, because the city of Oakland owned, what, something like 1,400 abandoned houses in Oakland? Or was it 14,000? Abandoned houses in Oakland. Any house that was left abandoned, because what they would do is the, their absentee slum laws would leave housing abandoned as a way of making a lot of money. They made a lot of money with that. They also have to gentrify, push the people out of the community, etc. So we said any house left abandoned for more than four months that the community control of housing boards could use the power of eminent domain and take those houses, put homeless people and other folk in those houses and what have you. I mean, it was an incredible law that we fought. We won 20% of the vote. We won, we had something like 25,000 votes on that. 
we ran against the slum lords, the communist party, all these forces, and, and one of the most liberal Negroes in the city said at the time that he couldn't support the country. It was too punitive to land, to, to land boards. How could that be? We got all these people sleeping. And then one of the progressive uh, county officials, uh, they named buildings for him, or some kind of center for him here. Uh, there was a place called Camp Parks, where the U.S. military used to test nuclear materials for something like 20 years, and it was abandoned. And this Negro said, well, put the homeless people in Camp's Park. In other words, nuke them. I mean, we had a major struggle in this city around, around these kinds of questions. I mean, this is capitalism at work, and this is the treatment of the oppressed people here, and it was a major campaign, and I forgot what the question was. <laughs> uh, uh, but the, the, one of the newspapers here said that if that measure wins the election on, on Tuesday, the governor then was Duke Major. He said Duke Major would order an airstrike on Oakland on Wednesday. <laughs> he said that's, that, that's not a win. Control, that's a win. Revolution is what they characterized. And uh, it was a real uh, movement. It was one that won support from across the board in virtually every community, uh, most of the communities here in Oakland, and without the money. But we waged a hell of a campaign for them uh, against them and scared them to death. But the question is, is they perfected this process of, of keeping people oppressed. And you see it often. You see, uh, if they don't like what's happening in Libya, uh, they have plants, stooges, uh, sleepers uh, in those places who will call a demonstration and 40 people might show up or not. Uh, and or they may claim, uh, because I don't know how the CNN happens to get there, uh, that uh, the government is treated badly, and the next thing you have is airstrikes uh, because they are harming their own people. This is the stuff that you hear all the time. They're protecting uh, the Libyans from their own people. Libya had the highest standard of living on the continent of Africa. If you were in Libya, you didn't pay for school, you didn't pay for housing, you didn't, the oil that came from the ground paid all of that for the people in Libya. You had free education, you had free housing, everything. That was what happened uh, there. And they, they killed it. That's what they did in, in uh, 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 you know, they've done that in various other places. They try to create this scenario, uh, this boogeyman that we have to go in and, and, and save the people and crush this entity. That's one thing they do. They have people, they set up NGOs. You know, they even got them in Russia. And they got NGOs in Russia uh, that would do something crazy for the purpose of getting repressed so that they can use it. They will do what they call regime change any place that they can. Uh, so, uh, and counterinsurgency is a war that, that maintains the, uh, the status quo. And in this country, uh, it was uh, employed uh, to kill Malcolm X, to kill Martin Luther King, uh, to in 1968 alone, I think something like uh, 300 <coughs> members of the Black Panther Party uh, were arrested. Some 30 members of the Panthers were killed around this country. Uh, uh, I was in and out of prison so much I had to read the newspaper to find out where I was. Uh, the FBI, which is the U.S. domestic political police, secret political police, had come up with a characterization of, of people who were struggling for our freedom as black nationalist hate groups. And they had a counterintelligence program called COINTELPRO, that was the acronym, Google it, uh, that identified Malcolm X as somebody who they would have had to kill if they hadn't killed him already. Uh, 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 Martin Luther King, uh, Stokely Carmichael, you know, and a host of other people. And then they had the sports they called key black extremists, Kiwis, uh, who were targeted throughout this country uh, to, to take out. Uh, they raided Panthers uh, so frequently throughout this country over and over again. They create all kinds of false bases for doing that. And then, as they were doing that, they raised up a sector of our communities uh, who were opposed to black power, who were opposed to the struggle of our people, 
and they put them in offices around this country and then called that black power. Somebody who fought against the struggle when it was happening, they stuck their asses in, in, in office and then they called that black power. Uh, this is part of what that counterinsurgency looked like. But the most insane thing perhaps that they did to us, and you may have read about this, uh, and it started in California. Uh, and uh, you heard of Freeway Ricky, is that what his name, Ricky Ross? Uh, a young African, uh, I think he was in LA, wasn't he? Who had never seen cocaine in his life, had never seen it in his life. And it was brought to him by the CIA. And, but it wasn't just brought cocaine, it wasn't cocaine. Somebody had gone into a laboratory and created this thing that derived from cocaine called crack. Oh. And they started, they distributed this stuff throughout. It was uh, insane in terms of its uh, addictive capacity. It destroyed our communities throughout this country. It fed all kinds of money into the economy, an ailing economy at that time. It constituted a kind of involuntary tax on the poor sector of the population because people had to get a hit. Every 12 minutes, you got to get another hit. And that money was going into stock markets, it was going into car dealerships and stuff like that all around this country. And yet they were convinced us that some 16-year-old high school dropout in the housing project has gone into a laboratory, the ones they say can't do math, has gone into a laboratory and created this crack cocaine. But not only that, has set up a network of airplanes and ships and what have you that gets this stuff throughout this country and around the world and bring it in something like they said, something like a 200 million or 200 billion dollars, what was it? A uh, 200 billion dollar or 200 million dollar, I forgot the, the actual figures now, annually. And so that's what we do. We get 200 million or 200 billion dollars moved into the housing projects, right? I mean, it's the most ridiculous, and they had helicopters, and you've seen the stuff that they did to us. They turned young women into prostitutes, places you never saw African women, streetwalkers before you saw that, having to get drugs in order to feed their habits, to feed their boyfriend and husband's habits and stuff like that. And then it's an insidious kind of insurgency because the people who are doing the drugs, taking the drugs, think that they thought of it themselves. Some of them thought they were actually getting over on the man by selling drugs. And what they did, of course, was cut off our participation in the legal capitalist economy and then impose an illegal capitalist economy in our community, so if the if the phone got paid, the dope man paid the phone. That's why we had here, we had a saying that the White House is the rock house, and Uncle Sam is the pusher man. That if you're selling dope, you're working for the government, for the United States government, you're a government employee. And that's what they laid waste our communities throughout this country. And it was written about. I mean, the guy Sam was in Mercury News, you know, Greg, what was his name? Say it again. Gary Webb. You know, uh, uh, first, he wrote this incredible uh, series of articles in the San Jose Mercury News. Uh, and then he wrote a book about what was much tamer than the articles that he had written. And, uh, and first, the LA Times and the New York Times, and then the San Jose Mercury News, they all came out against him. They dusted him up. He ended up committing suicide, uh, and driven to suicide because he exposed this thing that the CIA was doing in our communities. That's a common insurgency. And the thing that made it so much worse was so-called black militant and nationalist leaders uh, were attacking the black community. They would say that the drugs were, we were doing drugs because of some kind of moral deficit on the part of this poor working class who were being victimized by U.S. imperialism. And guess what? The thing about it is that the victim begins to think of himself uh, as the villain and actually begins to think, uh, like I said, that it was his idea. And what has happened, of course, somebody shuts off your food capacity and feeds you poison meat. And that's what they were doing, starving a people and then giving us poison meat to eat, eat this. And uh, it paid, we paid a dear price for that. And we still pay a price for that today. So counterinsurgency is a war. 
It's a form of warfare that's being made against oppressed people and happens everywhere because you cannot, you cannot control a colonized people. You can't keep this land. You cannot keep this land. You cannot keep African people living under the conditions we live without the utilization of extreme violence. It is an absolute necessity, extreme violence. So when you see the police kill a 12 year old in Cleveland, it's not because the police went wrong or bad. That's the way the stuff is supposed to work. When you see them kill Mike Brown in Ferguson and leave the body on 100 degree plus weather uh, on asphalt for four and a half hours, it's not because they, they couldn't get uh, an ambulance to pick him up. It's because it is supposed to set an example for every African that this will, what will happen to you if you go up against state power. That's what we're looking at. And counterinsurgency is very insidious. But revolution is a solution. And these guys can be had. The Vietnamese showed us they can be had. And other people who fought against them showed us they can be had. They can be and that's what we have to do. I have one more question for you. And we will have the opportunity to ask some questions. Okay. How is the world different today in the Trump era than what it was when you first formed the African People's Socialist Party in the 1970s? And how do you think the issue of socialism is relevant for African people today? I think what's different today is that the crisis of imperialism that we were seeing, even back in the 70s, has deep now. And it is profoundly deep. Like we said, we have, we see the perennial warfare. They can't stop fighting people around the world. They cannot stop because the people are intent upon taking back what it is, what we need in order to live, to survive, to take back things for our own resources. And, and this crisis makes itself manifest, not just, you know, here with tents and stuff like that. What's really interesting, speaking of capitalism, by the way, is to be in Oakland, and you see the growth of tents, homeless people in tents, on one side of the equation. And on the other side of the equation, these magnificent <coughs> structures, buildings going up, you know, uh, uh, that people are living in. That's capitalism. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, uh, Trump represents a depth of the crisis in, in many ways. And one expression of this crisis is, uh, that we knew, we recognized this going into, into this election with the Trump won. We knew, we didn't know Trump was going to win because I thought the United States government would kill him before, before they were allowed to win. Uh, but we knew that Hillary and George Bush, they had a rocket moment ahead of them, that, it was, that they were going to, we knew they were in for a shock. I mean, anybody who lived here could see that there was something happening here in this country and people were disgusted about the status quo. And people were just disgusted about the status quo. And so many people went in the direction that they thought. And here's what you have. The electoral process in this country, and most of what they call uh, democracies, is simply a nonviolent contest between contending sectors of the ruling class for control of a state for their own profit-making advantage. A nonviolent struggle between different sectors of the ruling class. An election is not held uh, to change things. Elections are held to make sure things stay the same. So you have an election, and this election, it doesn't happen like you, you, you don't have a situation like you have in some countries where uh, the conditions are so bad that there's no uh, even symbolic uh, democracy uh, prevailing. And if you want to get something, you just get a crew of people and guns and go ahead and take it here. There's an election. So you have these contending sectors of the bourgeoisie, <coughs> of the white ruling class, and then everybody who's running for office is running in the interest of some sector of the ruling class. You know that. If you didn't know it before, Trump told you that during the election. Then he said, he said these guys, these guys can't do anything. And they, you know, they can't even say anything because they have to say what the people who pay them want them to say. I, he said, I know because they used to pay them. You didn't see Trump saying that stuff? So I used to pay them. And what did you see with this election? You saw 17 people contending for the nomination of the Republican Party, five contenders for nomination uh, for the Democratic Party, all those 
people running to become president, which meant that you were looking at a severe split among the ruling class who were putting each, each di different sectors of the bourgeoisie, putting forth their guys to be the president. That was, that was extraordinary, watching that, and to watch how it was playing out. You're seeing how it's playing out even today. And so, so Trump was a candidate that was not beholden to any of them, to any sector of the bourgeoisie. Not, he's not as rich as he said, but Trump plays a good game, but he's got a lot of money. And so he was able to fund himself, and because he was not beholden to any sector of the bourgeoisie, he could say things that they couldn't say. And he would say them, because he didn't have uh, lobbyists who were running his campaign and stuff like that, like every other contender for president has. He didn't, he wasn't trying to protect this little interest or that little interest. He just set out, he was against all of them. And that attracted the attention of, of a large sector, well, a meaningful sector, a decisive sector. Of, uh, of white people in this country who were just disgusted. They were disgusted at me. They were disgusted at, uh, at uh, compañeros and compañeras uh, from Unión de Barrio, who were back there at the Mexican National Race Movement. <laughs> they were disgusted uh, at uh, uh, people who were around the world because America is looking bad and weak because people are fighting and taking back their stuff, and you know the whole flag is never supposed to touch the ground. And so these were people who were really disgusted. They were disgusted also because they could. They didn't have any jobs uh, uh, or anything like that. Uh, and, and they were looked down upon, obviously, by other sectors of bourgeoisie, by sectors of bourgeoisie. So Trump uh, became their champion. And uh, so that was one experiment. And then you saw the Bernie Sanders entity. And this was really interesting because you had Trump on the one end, Sanders on the other end, the most dynamic components of the electoral process were on both sides, Trump and Sanders. And then you had this insipid middle that was occupied by, by Hillary Clinton and the traditional bourgeoisie. The sectors that upset things more, most were the forces who were not tied, obviously, or deeply to the traditional sector of bourgeoisie. That doesn't mean Sanders was not tied to them. It means that they had put their money on this other horse. And so Sanders was left out of it. So you had these forces. People wanted something different. That's a severe crisis that they were looking at. And, uh, uh, and they would have killed Trump. I'm convinced of that. The only reason they didn't is because they took him for a joke. They thought he was a joke, a clown. And <clears throat> what happened, of course, by the time they woke up, uh, he had got so much traction in the white community <clears throat> that to do something bad to him would have caused him a real problem. In fact, Trump actually was stating that, you know, publicly, uh, uh, that it would come, if I lose this election, something happened, you know, people will rise up, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And he, had, he was probably true. Because you, remember, you remember those people who showed up at Obama rallies <coughs> carrying guns on their hip and on their shoulders and stuff like that. Uh, it was a very... Uh, incendiary uh, home. And I saw, I think what we see is a crisis of materialism is much deeper. Uh, to just say, the election, electoral process is the only way that most people in this country think that you can participate in politics with change. Yet, the choices they had in Clinton and Trump was really revealing <clears throat> that these candidates had to hold the highest negative numbers than any president in history, in candidate in history. That Trump was polling 60% or more negative, and Hillary was close on his tail, 59 some odd percent negative. This is what they were polling going into 100 million people didn't vote. <clears throat> didn't vote. And that's a profound crisis. But no one is acting like that crisis exists because they still think the world, they're trying to act like the world revolves around Trump and the Democratic Party. And part of what the Democratic Party is doing, of course, is pulling out the stops. And uh, with Me Too, the Women's March, <clears throat> and a whole bunch of other stuff that's supposed to be for you. And of course, you know that. 
but that's what it's supposed to be for. So I think the crisis is deeper now. It's not just deeper here, but it's deeper all around the world. And I think more and more people uh, are concluding uh, that uh, you can't reason with U.S. imperialism, you can't reason with the social system, that we're going to have to fight our way out of this. And that's a good sign. So I think that's what we're looking at in terms of crisis. That, and uh, that's, this is our time. This is our time. And that's why you know, we have to, to deepen our organizational capacity, <clears throat> bring more people into political life, uh, independent political life, I should say. Uh, and uh, it's a magnificent crisis. And, and I don't want to end the crisis. And that's the mistake that some people make, trying to solve the problem for the system to make it better. No, I want to deepen this crisis. I want to deal with yeah. this crisis. So the people have to be free. And we're not going to be free. As long as this thing is sailing properly, acting properly, we're in trouble. It's the crisis, but not by itself. The crisis by itself won't do it. What has to happen is that we have to be organized and have to be in organization. We have to have some strategic objectives to win our freedom. And this crisis offers us a splendid opportunity. What, what, are, the, what are the things, criteria for making revolution? Well, one, uh, to make a revolution, uh, you have to have crisis. People don't make a revolution, everything's cool. Crisis is, uh, uh, you have to have, uh, to make a revolution, uh, uh, you have to, uh, the, the ruling class has to be unable to rule in the same old way. That's what Obama and Trump and everything that we're looking at, they can't rule in the same old way. They can't do anything in the same old way. In order for there to be crisis, uh, you have to, the people have to have come to the conclusion that anything is better than what they are giving to us now. You've seen pictures in the past in different places where people are fighting with tanks with rocks. They've come to those conclusions and people will reach those conclusions in this country today as they have before, they'll do it again. And in order to make revolution, you have to have a revolutionary party that's guided by advanced revolutionary theory. Though that is the criteria for revolution. And I'm telling you that right now, we're on the cusp of revolution.
and it's such an honor to be here at the Uhuru House. Beautiful, isn't this a beautiful, beautiful place? I want to salute Chairman O'Malley Shatella, also the African People's Socialist Party, and say that the African Revolution, led by Chairman O'Malley Shatella, led by the African People's Socialist Party, does have a place for white people, and it's in the African People's Solidarity Committee, the organization of white people formed by Chairman Obama Chitella, formed by the African People's Socialist Party, with the job of working in the white communities to win others, just like ourselves, to separate ourselves from this vicious, vicious capitalist system, and to recognize our truest interest in standing in solidarity with the liberation of African people, with indigenous people, and oppressed and colonized peoples around the world, and to stand for reparations to African people, returning the stolen labor, the stolen resources, and, and the value that has been stolen from African people around the world. And it has been my honor to be a member of the African People Solidarity Committee since it was formed in 1976 in St. Petersburg, Florida. I lived here in Oakland for about 20 years during what we call the Oakland years when Chairman O'Malley Chatella was here, when on the stage, Huey, Huey Newton spoke on the stage, many, many historical events took place here, and this movement, the Uhuru movement, and Uhuru means freedom, means Swahili, by the way, I just want to make that clear, that um, many, many, many struggles took place organized through this building and from the, uh, the chairman, led by the chairman of the African People's Social Party, the Uhuru movement, fighting for, fighting for the completion of the Black Revolution of the 1960s. And I want to say that I want to see socialism. I want to see socialism. I think people are here because they do want to see that. That I don't want to live in a system built on the suffering of everybody else. I don't want to be part of, of white power sitting on the pedestal of the suffering of African people, indigenous people, that this land still belongs to the indigenous people just because a certain number of years have gone by. That doesn't end it. That compounds it. That compounds it. That all the contradictions of this society and this social system are boiling under the surface. And every time there's another young African, Mike Brown, Oscar Grant, somebody else killed by the police, the colonial police in this country, that is, that is because of this system built on the enslavement of African people, built on the genocide of indigenous people and colonialism all around the world. I want to see socialism. And I want to unite.
in a country where there's two Americas. I don't want the white pedestal. I don't want to live at the expense of somebody else. I do not want to live in a house or be part of some hipster paradise with artisan breweries and yoga studios while there's, there's African people being gunned down by the police or ramped up in the largest prison population in the entire world, or that there are thousands of people living in tents, like the chairman said, while well, huge buildings and gentrification is going wild here. I don't want to live in that. I don't want to make peace with that. I don't want to make peace with that. I want to understand what it's going to take, and I want to take responsibility to change that. And the chairman talked about organization. White people have to be an organization too, not our only organization. Organization under the leadership of the African working class, and that is what the chairman has fought for, the African working class. Not neocolonialism, not one whole thing, but the fact that African people are a nation of people. And that if we're going to be socialists, and I know that, you know, there's a lot of white people who are very uncomfortable with the system, and a lot of white people who are using and killing themselves with drugs and opioids and not going to prison for it, as Africans did. But it's killing themselves with alcohol, with committing, just plain committing suicide, all these different things. And I think that, yeah, I think, well, in a certain way, I respect that because to be well adjusted in this society, I mean, that's sick. That's sick. People who, who are desperately uncomfortable, but they don't know how to sum it up, they need to be here under the leadership of the African working class because this is where. There's a future for all humanity. This is where the problems of capitalism are going to be solved. And if we're going to be socialists, and the chairman laid it out so brilliantly, then we have to understand it. We, have, we can't be a socialist because we say we are. We can't be a socialist because we voted for Bernie Sanders or because we want... Um, Medicare or health insurance for everybody, we have to understand that capitalism was built, it rests on a foundation of genocide, slaughter, and oppression for everybody else, benefiting the whole white nation, the nation of white people. We have to take responsibility for that. We have to face that, and that is the basis the crisis that we see today, because all around the world people are resisting and fighting back. And like the chairman saying, you know you're not going to steal our oil or land or anything else. The U.S. has to pay a price for what it is doing around the world. And we have to take responsibility for the fact that capitalism is parasitic, like they said, like the chairman said. That it's not like capitalism was once good and then it went bad. Or it's not like it was even okay and then it went bad. It was born this way. It was born this way. White people were poor in Europe, poor in Europe until Europe assaulted Africa and turned Africans into commodities for sale, into means of production, into property that became the basis for the stock markets at Wall Street and the city of London and every other basis for wealth under imperialism. We have to be started with that. Europe was poor. And it was, it was also based on the assault on what is now called the Americans, the mass genocide of the indigenous people and the theft of this land and all the resources on it. And as we said, with colonialism around the world. This has, we have to look at this. We, we can't pretend to see the world differently from everybody else. What this movement calls on us to do is see the world as everybody else is experiencing it around the world. I call on white people to, to rise up because 
we have to take action now. We have to do the work. We have to pay reparations. We have to go into the white community to organize other people like ourselves to take a stand for the future of all humanity. And one of the things that the chairman tells us that is so that makes it so clear, at least to me, and he said it tonight, the struggle is not against racism, the ideas in white people's heads, the struggle is against colonialism. Therefore, African people are a nation of people, not a race, a nation of people who have a right to their land, their homeland of Africa. Indigenous people are a nation of people, not a race that liquidates the struggle, the right of, of oppressed people to struggle against colonialism inside the borders of the United States, just as they would any place else on this planet. And I think that that is so clear. That is so clear because it is and was the African Revolution of the 1960s that led the struggle against imperialism inside the borders of the United States. In that period, the Vietnamese recognized that, that the U.S. was fighting two battles. The FBI recognized it. That's why they called it the greatest internal threat to the stability of the U.S. since the Civil War. But the white left did not, did not recognize that. And that this challenges, the Uhuru movement challenges this hegemony that we see in the Bay Area, this white liberal politics that is about a justification for gentrification and imprisonment of African people and the continuation of what the chairman calls Ku Klux communism, that is about white people maintaining a greater percentage of the stolen loot to give it to more sectors of the white population based on the suffering of African people and the people on the planet Earth. So I, I just you know, want to say also that in this period, the African People's Socialist Party, and we're going to see a little bit more about this, is coordinating a project under its program of Black Star Industries, which is, which is commerce and business for and by African people all around the world, and has a program called the Black Power Blueprint, as Bakri laid out earlier, in St. Louis, which has tremendous support all over the country, even all over the world. And is a, an opportunity for white people to contribute reparations to African people as it is about the African working class having control of buying some of the abandoned houses and buildings in the city of St. Louis, in North St. Louis, and renovating them themselves and building the Uhuru House Center, political center, um, the Uhuru Jiko Kitchen, which is going to be the home of Uhuru Foods and Pies. That, is, that we know so well here in Oakland. Um, in St. Louis, it's going to be there. There's going to be a cafe, a community kitchen, and all of these kind of buildings, and also the question of housing and power and self-government in the hands of the African working class. And I want to, um, I want to call on everybody from the white community. We, we're working, we need to, we need to reach the white population. We need to get out there and be able to uh, win other other North Americans or white people to recognize our truest interest is to separate ourselves from the system, from this government, that to recognize that we have upheld it. We have been part of the state power. We have lynched. We have burned. We have participated in the genocide against indigenous people and African people and people around the world. And there's no future, there's no future with this system and with this government because the people on the planet Earth are intent on bringing it down. And I want to stand with that future. I want to stand not with white power. Black power means the end of all oppression on this planet. White power is built on oppression and suffering and enslavement. And that is the future for everyone that wants to be part of it. That this, that African people, African people of this land belongs to indigenous people. And that there can be no imperialism. The chairman said it. Capitalism must go. It must go. It must be wiped off the 
no reforming it. There is no uh, making it better. There's no helping it. There's no movement to build tiny houses that's going to save it. There's nothing. It, it doesn't, you know, oppressed people do not need charity. They want the law, what belongs to them. What belongs to them. And we have a responsibility to return that. And people, white people are worried about the environment. They're worried about, yeah, this whole climate change. And, and the fact is that there was no problem with the climate when indigenous people had this land, when this land was Mexico, when African people had Africa. There was no <coughs> melting of the ice caps. There was no end of the ozone layer. There, there was no methane gas explosion that we see now that was created by capitalism and the system of capitalism cannot solve the problem. It created the problem. And that we can live in a different world. We can live in a different world. We can't make friends with this. We can't make friends with this, this existence that we call life. This pursuit of happiness, which is about getting something with everybody else's children dying so we can get it. I don't want to live like that. Changing the world in the most real sense. And we can't just because we as white people suddenly want to be part of changing the world, we can't say, well, oh, can't we all get along now? No. No, we have work to do. We have responsibilities. We have to go in to the white community and unleash the soul and the resources. And that's the end of diversity. Because everything that, that capitalism has came off the backs of African people and indigenous people, and it has to go back to them. We are organizing in the white community. I, I want to say that African People Solidarity Committee, the Blue Solidarity Movement, has organizations in Boston, in Brooklyn, in Washington, D.C., in Huntsville, Alabama, in uh, Gainesville, Florida, Miami, Florida, St. Petersburg, Florida, of course, St. And those areas, and Seattle, Portland, here in Oakland, and other places in California as well. So we are growing. And this is the movement under the direct leadership of the Anglo Movement and African People's Socialist Party. Our job is reparations. We're going to hear more about building a group and hides as a way that we, as from the white community, can, can work to bring reparations and stand in genuine solidarity with this black star industry under the leadership of African women class this year, right here in Oakland. We want everybody, everybody to be part of this transformation. But we said it, we sell 10,000 pies this year as part of building, building the economic infrastructure of the African government, not just a demonstration, but building the infrastructure of African liberation and genuine social. So I just want to say Uhuru, and I want to I want to give the slogan that our comrade Jesse Neville, under the leadership of the party, um, carried out in um, the campaign for mayor and city council that took place this past year in St. Petersburg, Florida, where comrade from Solidarity Committee Jesse Neville ran on the slogan "Unity Through Reparations." I want to say unity through revelations. Uhuru. I want to thank Penny Hess for that rousing presentation. And Penny don't question. Anybody who works in the organization doesn't know that she pushes African internationalism full force. And that's the way it should be. And if there are white people here in the audience who aren't a part of USM, or the African People's Socialist Party, you should do it. I really appreciate everything on tonight. And in the back of the room, Penny has a book that she wrote called Overturning the Culture of Violence. You should get that book. Chairman Omalia Shetella has a book called Uneasy Equilibrium. You should get that book. It's on the tables back there tonight. Comrades, friends, brothers and sisters, today is February 17, 2018. Hundreds of years after the first African was brought here, we are still talking as African people about freedom, about independence, 
and about self-determination. I hope each and every last one of you here do not want to pass it on to any of your children or any of your progeny up under you. We must take responsibility to join the organization, join the whole movement more particularly, and be about fighting for our freedom in our lifetime. Not in our children's lifetime, in our lifetime. Like the chairman said, they can be had and we can do it. You heard him say that the United States government said the biggest internal security threat to this country was who? The Black Panther Party. And who was the Black Panther Party? Young African brothers and sisters out in the streets of Oakland, California. So this is where we must go to organize, and that's why we must build. And that's what we're going to do. Um, we're going to have the chairman speak, uh, answer questions in a few minutes. we got some more business to take care of. Earlier today, we talked about um, the work that was happening in St. Louis. I said I was going to show you pictures. What we're going to do is a little slideshow, um, PowerPoint. And then after that, um, we're going to call people to join. We need social media. We need all kinds of things. We're going to ask people to join. So I want to bring up Olivia Wagner, who is our local leadership here for the whole Schools and Pies. And I think Maureen herself has been here for at least, and I'm not trying to tell you anything, but Maureen has been here for probably the whole time, I'm not going to say a number of years, but she's a tremendous comrade and work with the world. So, um, I'm just very honored to be on this stage today with Chairman Amalia Shatella, who um, is back in Oakland for, as I said earlier, the first time in 15 months. Um, and also, I'm not sure we can have us. What we want to do is we want to show you a video that was actually done earlier this month in St. Louis of the Black Power Movement. And um, if you have not seen any of um, the work that's been going on in St. Louis, even since this video was done three weeks ago, it's just tremendous to see the Uhuru House in St. Louis. And I just want to salute also um, the chair of Guys are still hungry, there's still food back there to eat. I appreciate folks coming here. I just want to recognize certain people. We have Union de Barrio in the house. They go up in Southern California. We have the nation known the Barrio for many, many, um, many years. Where's Bronco Chess? Okay, I'm not going to give you back. We can give you back out. I want to uh, recognize Brother Elijah. Brother Elijah is a brother who's a patron of our profession. We did renovations here in this building. 
what, about two years ago? Three years ago? And this brother has donated skills, time, brought people here, and you got to really thank this brother for the work he put in to help renovate this building. So, Brother Liza, raise your hand, please. Comrade here has been uh, fighting for indigenous people's rights and self-determination for many years. She was based out in San Jose, California, when they took her son away and put him in these uh, torture chambers called the SHU uh, throughout the state of California. Some of you heard of them, uh, the security housing units. These people are deprived of uh, social interaction for 20-something hours a day out of 24 hours. And her son was in there, and we brought a lot of attention to that. We went to a uh, place throughout California where indigenous and Africans locked arms and did the work they need to do to free our comrades in these prisons. So I really want to appreciate her. I want to recognize from Santa Cruz, California, Paul Kessler, who's almost single handedly upheld the work of the Rural Foods and Pies in Santa Cruz, the Pie Piper of the Rural Foods and Pies in Santa Cruz. <laughs> and there are people all throughout this room I have to recognize. Um, Bridget, who's a young sister who I just met, and she's from St. Louis, and I know we're going to show places that she recognized. Brother Root is in the house, but Tina's in the house, um, and a host of other people here. I know uh, there's some people who are here for the first time. We want to welcome you to the Brewer House. And I want to let people know that this beautiful building is for rental. People can come here and rent this building for repasses, for anniversaries, family reunions. You know, you have meetings, you've got social clubs, you can come here and rent this building. I'm meeting with a sister here next week so that we can talk about how we can that up off the ground and running. So I really want to appreciate everybody here on tonight. I see Joe Hamburg is in the house. Joe is someone who worked for many years as a manager of the World And uh, I know we've got a lot of rural furniture folks in the house. And listen, can y'all raise your hand? Stephanie, Brian, who else is here for rural furniture? All right, y'all. I'm telling you, we got an organization on the ground here in Oakland that we want to grow. I know some people here got some skills, some people got uh, computer skills, some people have uh, gift of gab skills, some people have typing skills. We need all kinds of skills, but what we need is the will of the people to want to be free. That is the biggest skill that we need, is your will. Bring what you can, and we will make this work happen. And I ran out of words to talk about so I had to do this But um, I tell you, I've worked with the chairman many, many, I remember the first time I came to this rural house, um, and one of the first things I remember the chairman saying, we got to win the minds of our people. And that's exactly what we got to do. He talked about counterinsurgency and how one of the things they use is psychological warfare. We have to win the minds of our people back to revolution. Because revolution was real in this country in the 1960s, and we got to bring that back.
that we are quite proud of. And a group of folks uh, who came with one of Munya Nabagio's uh, leaders uh, from uh, uh, Ron Cortez uh, drove up from uh, LA. And we're really happy that they came to be with us. And I know you've been here for a long time, but with your permission, I really would like uh, if Ron could just say, you know, a couple of words to us, you know, uh, briefly. You, I was in Berlin, Germany. I, I was a youngster living in the South, in Florida, and assumed uh, that uh, the contradictions, many of the contradictions of experiences had to do with the fact that I was in this small southern city. So uh, I joined uh, the U.S. Army. I was in Berlin when the, when the wall was put up. I was there. I was in one of the first tanks, U.S. tanks, that faced a Russian military tank uh, in combat mode and had to ask myself a lot of questions. Uh, but, you know, Ronald Wilson Reagan uh, was in Berlin also. I think he, he stood up there and said something about Mr. Gorbachev. Tear down that wall. Anybody remember that? Yeah. And John F. Kennedy was there also. I was there when Kennedy came through. He made the statement that I am angelic or not. He didn't know that's what he was saying. He was trying to speak German. <laughs> um, and I'm thinking about the wall because there's a lot of discussion about walls in this country right now. And of course, uh, I don't have to say tear down that wall, it's wall, it's going to come down. It's going to come down in part as a consequence of the united struggle between the African and the Mexican people in this territory. And uh, the balance of power, you think about the Africans here, the Mexicans here, and the Mexicans on the other side of that artificial border, and the power that's going to represent in revolution history ground. Because that wall ain't going to be able to stop the revolution. Revolution history ground, uh, it's going to be able to penetrate that wall. I mean, the wall is going to come down. And in the process of bringing the wall down, I'd like to ask uh, the other one, uh, Ron Cortez, to come up and just say a few words. <laughs> It is uh, such an honor for, for me at, at a personal level to be here and as an organization within the divider, it's an honor for, for us to be here, to be invited to be here, Comrade Chairman. Um, you know, at the personal level, my own political development, uh, I can attribute a lot of that to uh, Chairman Omali. Uh, I met you when I was still a college student. I used to be young at one point um, and I learned tremendously from the work of the party of the African Socialist Party, and I know that our organization, Linda Divider, has learned tremendously from the work of the party. And we think it, it's really significant that we've been able to have such a long relationship, a political relationship built on not just uh, not just theory, but a revolutionary uh, unity that we understand that if not for our unity, uh, I don't know if we're ever going to be free. We can't do it on our own. Yeah. But if we unite, like the chairman was saying, we will. And we know that right now, while the current face of imperialism labels us as illegal and alien and foreign on our own historic homeland, we know that it's that same language of empire that criminalizes the African people here on this land and that is used to attack them. You know, that's why we have that common enemy, the historic common enemy of white power. And that's why it's an honor for us to be here, to continue to work. Um, you know, I, I think that as comrades, we always should be in solidarity with each other, but also to uh, support and challenge each other. So I want to challenge comrade and the comrades here. We need y'all in Los Angeles. We need the African People's Socialist Party in Los Angeles. 
Because we have a lot of African people in LA, but we really lack revolutionary leadership. And that's not because the African people don't want to participate in revolution, it's because we know what the system has done to our revolutionary movements. And it's in Los Angeles, it was pretty much wiped out, um, you know, military. And that's why we need to rebuild that. So in LA, we're doing our thing, and we want to continue to be in solidarity with the work that's happening here and everywhere the African people are. And um, I know we'll be there in St. Louis. I don't know who's gonna go, but we'll be there. Um, and this is my first time here. It's beautiful. Man, we need a space like this in, in South Central LA and everywhere else that our people are struggling. So with that, uh, we say black and brown, revolutionary unity, you know, fighting against the same system, and building a real socialist state of giving the power uh, to the working class in general, but to Africans and to our people right here in particular. Thank you. And one thing that we do is we test all of our equipment before, which we did. Things happen. We're going to roll with the event and appreciate you guys tolerating that. I want to bring Maureen back up. So, yes, I want to also echo the South Racism. Go onto YouTube, Black Power Blueprint Station, and look at all the videos. Go to Facebook, Black Power Blueprint look at all of the pictures, and you can see what Black Power Economic Development really looks like in the hands of the community, led by the party of the African American class, the African People's Socialist Party, through its organizations, the African People's Education Defense Fund, and the Black Star Industries. It is powerful, it is real, it is happening now, and I'm just so honored to be a member of the African People's Solidarity Committee, and I want to speak to white people here tonight. We have to support this movement. We have to be a part of it. We have to give. We have to give. We have to give. And we want to raise $2,000 tonight to build work. The chairman of Mali Chatello is leading. As we said, the chairman has not been here in 15 months, and it's, he is wanted every place in the world where African people are. The system was built on the stupid African people everywhere in the world, so the chairman needs to be there. And it's just such an honor to be on the stage tonight. So we want to raise $2,000 tonight, and it's reparations. It's reparations to give the money, it's reparations to do the work in Kufus of Pies, to sell pies in front of Shoppers Corner in Santa Cruz, or to be at the farmer's market at Grand Lake. And just having said that, I want to sit with Bakriel Kotunji, who leads um, the farmer's market for the Blue Foods and Pies, and who today broke our record. You know, I, I felt that record was going to be broken. I actually left half the shift today, and I felt like a mother leaving a child. I didn't want to leave the market, but I had to, to be here today to be in place. But I'm telling you, the work we're doing down there is phenomenal. It is Black Power Blueprint in Oakland. We're going to do it in Oakland. We're going to do it in St. Louis. We're going to do it in Broadway, wherever African people want Black Power Blueprint to go. Y'all know what a blueprint is, right? It's a plan that you can put wherever you want to put it, and that's what we're going to do. We're doing it right here in Oakland right now. We're doing it in St. Louis right now, and we're going to raise $2,000 right now. How many people think we can do it? Raise your hands. I mean, we're not here alone. We got Facebook world out there, too. We can do it with us. We can do it. We got people in Seattle, St. Louis, Huntsville, St. Petersburg, Florida, Los Angeles, San Diego, and I don't know how many other places, but I know there's a lot of people who are watching this program right now today and who will be giving us money. So with that said, um, and is there any one person in Facebook or in this room who has $2,000 that they want to give. I know somebody got $2,000 to give it tonight. Don't be bashful, don't be shy. You got a buddy next to you, they give you $1,000, $1,000, $1,000, right? 
You go out and up there, some mathematicians in the house, you go four people, five hundred, you work it that way. But realistically speaking, how many people are willing to give tonight? Then I'm going to get to the denomination. How many people are willing to give? Not going to know the denomination just. That means the majority of us, right? Okay, so we're going to carry this load. Our goal is how much? Uh, 2,000. Are we going to make that goal? Yes. Yeah, I'm right there. Okay. All right. Now, we're going to have to lock the door. We're going to open the door to bring more people in. That's what you do. So, with that said, who has, um, he said 1,000. He said 500. Anybody want to do 250? Any one person, 250. Is somebody on the computer where we can find out if somebody's actually yeah, there? Yeah, Okay, there. good. All right, y'all in Facebook land. You want y'all to show face first? Anybody? A hundred dollars. Okay. Oh, we got one 250 person right now. 250, and we go back up. So, we're going back up to 250. So, who is that? Who's matching? Maureen is saying 250. Who's matching her? It can be two people. Did I see somebody else's hands back there in the back? All right, so that means we need a whole bunch of 100. Did you see that? I saw something in a flash. Somebody here. Yeah, okay, you can do something. it in secret. You don't want your whatever to know that we have a 250, but this is where it needs to go. That's right. This is the best investment you can make um, in so many ways so that we don't have to live off of anybody else, as Jordan Pence has, has said. So, 100, we get a bunch of those. We got one, two, okay, this is three. Let me mention names. Okay, hold hands up. So, say your name, please, sir. Oh, okay. Yes. Ron. Ron. Pete. Pete. Paul. Paul. Poti. Ann. Ann. Yes, and if you would like to pay by credit card, Okay. Um, if you'd like to pay by credit card, which means you can get more, you can see Kara Lock right there, and you can pay it off as you go. Um, so we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, we are nine fifty. Was there another hand over here? I thought I saw one more hand. <coughs> so, right. I only know because he's taking pictures of this. <laughs> So, where are we at? 250? I'm saying we have 250 and we have another. Yeah, we can take it back to 500. No. Okay, 250. Anybody, 200? Any one person or two people can do 75 each, make 150. Okay, we went through the 100. What's that? I see somebody hand over there. 75, okay. And your name? Sucha, $75. We're about halfway there. A little bit to go. Okay. Anybody else want to match up? $75. $50. Okay. Anybody want to match up? $75. Anybody? Your name, sir? Ron. Ron. Anybody else to match Rob? Don't scratch it here. All right, what's your name, sister? Romana. <laughs> Romana. I like that. All right, Romana. This your first time here, Romana? How did you hear about us? Paul. Paul, right on. Okay. Santa Cruz in the house. All right. Good to see you, Earl. How you doing? Mr. Black? All right. So, anybody else? 75. I know. Back there, what's your name? Randall. Randall, all right. So, <laughs> we don't want Randall to stand the last 75, so who, who's going to be the next $75 donation person? All right, $50. Who has $50 they want to give tonight? Somebody bring it to me. Who did? So, 50, 25. See, what's your name? Jeff. 
What's your name now? Lynette. Lynette. All right, Lynette. All right, anybody else? 25 dollars
But we want you to be here next week, Sunday, the 25th at 4 p.m., as well as tomorrow at 4 p.m., but next week, Sunday at 4 p.m., to talk more about how we can do it, what skills you're bringing to it, what skills you'd like to learn from it, because we will train people when they're available, who you know, how we can collectively do 10,000 hides between Santa Cruz, Berkeley, Oakland, and San Francisco this year. And I have to say that, you know, we sold these pies in November. We're getting calls every single day for the pies, and especially the sweet potato pies. So again, I want to say to North Americans who are here working in the food and pies, that is reparations. Africans have worked for 600 years to build a system, to build our lifestyle. We can build a new future through the work in the Black Star Industries. We've been promising all evening long that we want to give each and everybody here the ability to ask questions of the chairman. Since I was only one earlier, I'm going to extend that to the audience. So if anybody has any questions, they can come up here to the mic. And you guys can line up here at the mic and raise whatever questions that you want. And we want to do this uh, with non-violent uh, verbal sparring. Is that Sister Monique from Richmond, California coming up? To, I want to say Sister Monique came here on January 15th when we did our Mark Luther King work where we went out in the community and put thousands of door hangers. She came and walked through the streets of these doors and participated. She came back to our appreciation, volunteer appreciation dinner, and she's here today. So I really appreciate this sister coming back here from Richmond. The word. Before you raise your hand, I just wanted to salute uh, ten-year-old sister Manai. Um, I'm so proud of you. Um, there's a there's a nine-year-old uh, Yebo who works uh, in our movement, and she's a part of the you know the same kind of process that you just donated to. And she's a brilliant young girl, and I'm so proud of you. And I want to thank you so much. And I do hope. And she'll continue to participate in the movement. Yeah, thank you so much. Uhuru. Uhuru.
We said the only way to colonize can be cured is to kill the colonizer. And the reality is, it's going to be struggle that we engage in that's going to deal with the trauma that we experience. In our party, we see reparations as a function of revolution. That, that this government is going to offer reparations. reparations. So down the matter about that crisis sequence, but it will be something like an attempt to pay off for a particular sector who can be won to accepting something as a way of saying the debt is over. We're going to have to fight our way out of this, and it's going to take revolution. They're not able to pay us in that fashion. And I think that what I've recognized is when we engage in the struggle for our freedom, that's the best way to deal with the trauma that you're talking about. That's the most curative thing that you can experience. I'm telling you that somebody who's been victimized by it, I can't tell you the sense of liberation that I experienced in all of this just when I made the determination that I'm going to fight these sentence, that, you know, uh, there's going to be this one person that they shall always remember as having fought them tooth and nail for our liberation. And most of the trauma that we experience, the thing that makes it so lasting is those periods where we're not fighting back. You know what I mean? When you get involved, you go to the department store, you just want to buy something, you know, Gives a white people your money. And, uh, you know, you get insulted by some 19 year old clerk. Or it happens to us all the time. And then you have to restrain yourself because you know the next thing out of the mouth is going to be security. And, I mean, this is just the reality that we live with every day when you can't fight back, you can't resist, you can't wear your pants this way, you can't wear your hat this way, you can't talk like this, you can't excel it to us. That's how we live, and that's the thing that maintains. You talk about trauma happening slavery, it's just the stuff we have, have every day. Hypertension, you know, all kinds of physical ailments and disease that come as a consequence of suppressed uh, brains and uh, a need to struggle. So, I believe that we have to work with each other and we have to be able to experience and express love to each other. And then it takes a vanguard to do that, that ordinary folk won't do it necessarily by themselves, that we have to help through example, to be able to show love and experience that and to try to create communities, our communities, uh, where that is an ongoing factor. And of course, the highest expression of love that you can have is the struggle against the system and what's happening to the people in our communities. So I know it's not a good answer. Uh, but the trauma that we experience uh, is not going to the government, nor any of its institutions, will do anything to relieve that trauma. That's on us. And part of that, what's going to take that is the actual struggle itself and the actual acquisition of freedom, of independence, state power, our own power, so that we can begin to construct the kind of society that we want. That's the solution. That's the solution. And in the meantime, I'm not talking about some passive, I'm not talking about some passive stuff. I mean, I'm sorry that you can't see what we're doing in St. Louis. The reason that, that, that Huey P. Newton was able to make a speech here in 1987, after the revolution had been defeated, generally speaking, the reason he could be here is because the revolution lives in this party, because we say we're going to complete the black revolution of the 60s. I and mean, when you and me, Newton didn't have a black Panther party, he said it. He said, he said, they may have destroyed the black Panther party, but we have the Uhura House. They may have destroyed the black Panther newspaper, but we have the burning spears, so they haven't done anything by crushing one organization. The revolution lives in us, in this party the advanced attachment of the African Revolution, and in you being able to participate in this process as well. This is where our cure is going to come from. we got to tear this sucker down. It's a disease. It carries disease. It spreads disease. Uh, and not just through slavery. I mean, every aspect of my lives. Look at people in the tents and what happened. What is it to live in a tent in these circumstances when you see nothing but wealth all around you? Why don't you and you all have it? 
Why doesn't man have it? Why doesn't the children in these communities live in, why don't they have it? There's no reason, there's no rational explanation why they should be a poor African, a poor Mexican, or indigenous person here. It's irrational. If anybody should be poor, it should be white people. If there, if there had to be poverty, <laughs> of course it doesn't have to be poverty. There's enough resources to feed the world, and that's our responsibility to break down the things that stand between us and that ability. Uh -huh. Yes, Mr. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, I just brought your book. And, uh, I can't wait to read it. I'm glad you decided for this. Splendid for you. Probably. What um, part of Africa were you in? Oh, Nigeria. My dad's from Nigeria. I still have family out there. I'm going to be some more to you. Okay. Uh, yeah. My father was an economics major graduate from Cal. I'm an economics major graduate from San Diego State. <laughs> Uh, I think it's about reparations too. Uh, I'm trying to process and see what that looks like as far as uh, whether people thinking that we're going to get, we're going to get money or we're going to get the land that's owned to us. Because um, I just feel that getting the money from the oppressor and giving it back to the oppressor is not the best thing for us to do. Getting the land and actually being able to grow our own, raise our own, and pretty much do everything ourselves, like we were doing in Africa, and like we still do in Africa. Um, and I know this America was stolen from the Indians and the Mexicans. So my thing is that do we really want to stay here and do things to this here America? Because what I've also learned is that this is the only place on earth where there is African Americans. We were raised here, we were raised here. So that being said, I just want to see or hear your thoughts about that. Hold on. <clears throat> First of all, as I said earlier, for us, the issue of reparations is a functional revolution. Uh, that, that's what's going to have to happen. But even this system, social system to be left standing. <coughs> to be left standing, it kills, it destroys. Even if the U.S. government said, okay, tomorrow I'm giving a check to all the black people in this country, uh, they still got drones moving all around the world, assassinating, murdering people, they still starving people to death, they still building walls, they still doing all of this activity. Then, and it's still exploiting you. You are the one who just said it. They still exploit you. Give them the money, they can take it right back. So the thing is, the system has got to grow, and that part of our program has to be doing that. Now, I don't know of any other organization that's getting reparations except this one. We talk about <coughs> Black Power Blueprint. I'm sorry you cannot see what we're doing with that project. Because it's an economic development project. Because the struggle the, against colonialism and liberation ultimately is a struggle to get control of the productive forces because what has happened is, when, is, is an alien and foreign power has taken away the land and the people and everything that poss makes it possible for us to produce for ourselves. And so if you look around the world and you see where the imperialists are making such aggression against the people, it is in those places where people are taking back those processes, those that ability to produce for themselves, whether it's in Venezuela, whether it's in Afghanistan, any other place around the world. That's what you see in pluralism trying to lock people down. Because that's what the real struggle is about. And that's what we have to win. We have to take that. Also, uh, when you talk about, uh, uh, if you look at the programs we've got, we, 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 we have programs, we've had programs in Sierra Leone, for example, uh, where we were initiating you know, like farms, uh, we've done uh, things like uh, reproductive centers, you know, for women because the highest, highest maternal uh, uh, death uh, rate in the world is right there. See, one out of every eight women would die in pregnancy, who, who was pregnant would die. Uh, so we are working in various places around the continent. And I'm saying this because we're not going to be able to grow enough cotton weeds on the continent of Africa to free ourselves. Because they control that too. They control the world economy. 
We're going to have to liberate the total Africa, all of Africa. That's why we have a party organization, uh, several party organizations, what they call South Africa. That's why we are located in Sierra Leone. That's why we are located in Kenya. Uh, that's why uh, uh, we are located in Uganda. Uh, that's why we are located in Tanzania. We're doing work in those places because, and that's why also we are located uh, uh, in France, uh, in England, uh, in Sweden, uh, uh, and in, in the Caribbean, actual political organizations there. Uh, because we're going to have a fight on every continent, everywhere we are. This is why you're going to have not have socialism in one country because the African revolution is going to take place all over the planet Earth. We're going to unite this whole revolutionary movement and revolutionary struggle. And that's the part of the process of taking back our resources. So I wanted to just say that we talk about growing the way we do in Africa. Uh, we catch a hell on the continent, despite that thing that you just saw in the movies the other day. That, that place doesn't exist. And, and, and if it did, it would not be a consequence of some superhero. Uh, it's going to take revolutionary organization to do what has to be done on the continent of Africa and every place we are located. So I believe in reparations. And reparations is very powerful because it's a unifying demand. It's something that unifies African people, and I think that's a real progressive thing. Reparations is very powerful because African people here and every place else live for generations uh, being fed the nonsense that we live off the welfare of white people. Uh, of socialism, when white people have lived enough welfare of black people some more than 500 years. And uh, to deal with the question of reparation, for Africans to deal with the question of reparation means that we have to peel back, you know, uh, all of that nonsense and come to terms with who we are because some people actually think that the slave master helped the slave. You understand? Uh, uh, and it's we who fed this son. He didn't feed us, we fed him and didn't get anything in return. Colonialism. We fed them and didn't get anything in turn. They pretend to give us civilization and the ability to live. So we have to make this revolution. And I think I like that concept of reparations for the reason I just mentioned. And when we look at what's happening, Black Power, Black Power Blueprint in, in, in St. Louis, I wish you could see it. Because St. Louis is under serious assault. Uh, it, in, in the 1950s and up to the 1960s, there were something like 800 and 50,000 people lived in St. Louis. And now there are only 300,000 people there. You know why? Because of the 60s, the revolution, the black power thing. All, many of the white people, they deserted St. Louis. And there are 92 different municipalities in that county alone, 92. That's where Ferguson came from. It was first a white flight joint, where they have their own cities and stuff like that, where they don't have to deal with black people, have their own police, their own everything, and then they hire black people to come through the dirty work for them, and they get all the money to fund their cities by, by stopping Africans uh, and, you know, giving tickets and stuff like that. That's how that stuff works. But now, you look at St. Louis. It's, they say it's 47% Africa. I said at least 50%. At least 50% African in St. Louis. You see nothing but deteriorated houses, things dilapidating, all of this in Africa is being pushed out. But the pushback is coming with Black Power 96. We went into St. Louis, and this is stuff we've done in, within the last six months that I'm talking about. We acquired one property, 9,000 square feet, built on a main thoroughfare uh, uh, in the African Union, North St. Louis. And we've been engaged in a project to renovate that three story building with the basement, 9,000 square feet with the back walls down. And we've called on people from everywhere around this country and the world to participate. And, and North America has been participating in reparations. We've got to raise $300,000, not just for that building. That's just a part of it. But Barker mentioned to you, right across the street from that, we have uh, at least two buildings the same size. We've purchased an empty, an empty, two empty lots, four properties. We're going to destroy them, level them, put an event space there uh, for the people, put a community garden there. We're talking about, uh, 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 we used to have a place here called Uhura Bakerman Cafe. It existed for a long time. Paul Kessler built the cabinet. This, the, 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 the uh, what do you call that? Where you, you know, you come in and seek the show. This play case. Because his mama made it. Because his mama used to be a supporter of this movement too. <laughs> uh, uh, and um, in, in 1989, when the American government attacked Panama, a bomb and invaded Panama, we had a, a, a meeting at that World Bakerman Cafe. 
to bring people there will be organized to have a demonstration at the at the uh, recruitment station, I think it was Marines or something. Uh, uh, and that day, that day, the, the building was set apart. The Kuhuru Bay Cafe. That was in 1989. Uh, and we said, well, it's not too bad. We can open up again in a couple of weeks. That night, they burned it down again. That place has been vacant. The same place we, has been vacant, vacant, sitting out all these high rises and, and, and uh, townhouses going up all around. It's been vacant since 1989. So the thing is that part of it is reparations. Part of it is struggling for self-determination, developing our own capacity to produce for ourselves, to feed, clothe, and house ourselves. That has to be like an incredibly significant aspect of what it is that we have to do. And then what people have made contributions. Uh, we raised, what, something like $25,000 uh, uh, over the last month for, uh, for the project uh, uh, in the Black Power Blueprint uh, right there in St. Louis, and we're going to raise uh, everything else that we need. So people have given reparations uh, uh, to us as a consequence of the participation in this movement, this solidarity movement. When Paul Kessler's taking those those uh, pies out uh, in Santa Cruz, uh, and is he still the high, biggest pie seller? He's one of the biggest, okay. Okay, you got some contenders here. <laughs> uh, uh, but that's part of a reparations movement. You know, Man, the government didn't give it, corporations didn't give it. These are white people who want to be on the right side of history, who recognize that all value in their communities come from slavery and colonialism. That's a great thing. So we get one great thing. Um, I just wanted to say that, like, um, just looking at this crowd, it's sort of an older crowd, so I'm wondering how do we kind of reach the youth, you know, because I go to UC Berkeley, so, like, I'm willing to make, you know, connections with the audience. because I feel like a lot of the youth, especially black youth, were uneducated in this, and we don't get this knowledge unless we get lucky enough to come to college, and that's when we start really trying to, like, do colonialize our mind, but I feel like this is something that needs to reach high school, it needs to reach, you know, people who are younger, like the nine-year-old that we have there. Yeah. So that's beautiful, right? And like, yes. there's more of that. Yes. But I also feel like, you know, being a college student, like, we have those resources and that's a big thing, and so it's just kind of hard to mobilize college students in a way. So I'm wondering, how do we, like, pull in the youth? Because, like, I feel like this would be, like, way more impactful if this was, like, Full room of like sure. young black women or whatnot. Um, I also kind of wanted more info on the African People Solidarity Committee. I felt like I didn't really get much info on the concrete work that y'all were doing in terms of like white allyship. Mm -hmm. I also wanted to say, like, just on the side note, you know, black people have always been working towards their freedom. We have always resisted. And like white solidarity is cool, but I'm still black, bottom line, and I'm still skeptical. So I just want y'all to know that like as white people, we don't need y'all. We're gonna, we're gonna, we've been doing this movement, we're gonna continue to do it. We're gonna get our liberation with and without y'all. So don't think in this like white savior complex, because we really don't need y'all. We can be doing this all on ourselves, but it is appreciated on that allyship. I just want to. Uh, let me let me say a couple of things. I'll say right on uh, to that. Actually, the, we may have the oldest part of our movement, maybe here. Um, it, well, how old was uh, how old was uh, uh, Akili when she ran for city council? Eighteen? Nineteen? I mean, you know, sister from our party just ran for city council in St. Louis before. She's nineteen. Uh, there's a, uh, I think maybe the youngest member in the party is 15 years old. You know, uh, we have a very young party. I mean, I'm the geriatric of the party. You know, uh, uh, and, uh, but generally speaking, and that's part of the reason for that, is that the party's presence uh, has not been that strong in open for a while now. And, and that's the thing that we want to, you know, change. And you can help us change that. Uh, because, and, and, Generally speaking, our, party, our movement is young, and the, the nine-year-old that I'm talking about, uh, her name is, uh, is uh, Ye Wu, 
uh, her mother, uh, Kunde Mambita, uh, is somebody uh, uh, who lost her 16-year-old uh, child, daughter, uh, with two other, with, with two 15-year-olds when the Pakistan Sheriff's Department uh, pushed them uh, into a pond and drowned them to death. And her mother joined the movement from off of that and brought her children with her and, and, and uh, the nine-year-old is the person I'm talking about, but they're young people, they're a generally young organization, and that's also true in terms of the North American movement, but I think about it, the North Americans in St. Louis, <coughs> uh, in, in most of Boston, and throughout it's mostly younger people. And so uh, you just gotta help me do something about that here too. So uh, that's one thing I want to say. The other thing I want to say is that uh, uh, I think it's absolutely appropriate uh, for African people to be suspicious of white people. Uh, I think it's absolutely appropriate that something would be wrong with you if you weren't, you know? Uh, uh, but I think that uh, what we rely on is the science. And um, for me, uh, much older than you, um, I had to actually learn how to hate white people before I could love myself. Because my identity that was imposed on me by foreign and Ill, aliens and colonizer um, was something that, uh, that was uh, a reflection of who white people were supposed to be. Everything good, everything powerful, everything beautiful, and then Africans were just the opposite. Most Africans have difficulty because of that, even loving their own parents. Because you can't even, you, if you hate yourself, you can't love your mom. Stuff, you know, so there's a, a the power of colonialism, and it doesn't just affect us, it, it affects Vietnamese who are in South Vietnam and who go to the barbershop and have their eyes round so they look like white people. Uh, it affected even in China today, you have that same kind of, of thing. Colonialism is terrible, and it and look at what uh, poor Michael Jackson, even wealth and extraordinary talent and what have you was not enough. Uh, that he had to mutilate himself uh, uh, over and over and over again uh, in order to try to look like a white person because that was the symbol of success. And so horrible things have been done to us and, and I had to go through this process but over a period of, of time uh, I was also forced to another kind of realization uh, because I have uh, been involved in a struggle for a very long time. And I do remember Papa Doc Dubois. And I do uh, remember uh, uh, Joseph Mugutu <clears throat> and a whole host of other people who participated with white people to kill and destroy us. And I, and, and I had to face one thing that it certainly wasn't their complexion or melanin level that made them do that. And I had to look at who white people are. Because, you know, the nation of Islam, the old nation of Islam, uh, had this very bold statement in the 1950s, say the white man is the devil. <laughs> well, so, did you hear that? The white man is the devil. <clears throat> well, if you got to believe in religion, it seemed to me that that fits the bill, right? <laughs> uh, but, but, I'm not religious. Then there's a very uh, famous woman who, uh, very educated, very smart woman, uh, who concluded that white people are uh, mutations, mutants, and that's why white people do and act the way they do and act. And so we have this, and, and this something genetically wrong with them, something wrong with us, of, of an, the wrong affiliation with God, or the wrong God and all this stuff, but that's not what it is. White people, uh, if we were forced to conclude that white people and the fundamental thing is that all human society is motivated by the quest to produce and reproduce life. All human society. And that uh, a problem that we have, uh, that white people have, is that for the last 600 years or so, that uh, they have produced life at the expense of other people. It's what keeps them alive. That's what capitalism is. It's a parasite. They suck the blood of everybody around the world. All the shiny cars and 
big houses and modern appliances and stuff like that and burglar bars, uh, security bars, etc. Uh, comes to blood that's because of sucking blood of everybody else. And they act a certain way because they have to be able to explain what they do. You don't ever hear a society saying, uh, we are we rich because we murderers and we slaughtered and we stole everything and kidnapped. They don't even, they don't even acknowledge slavery. And, and uh, etc. So, uh, you know, what happens is that any society, all societies, are comprised of a, a, an economic base. That's the way, the way that society gets what it needs to live, and a superstructure. And that superstructure is the philosophy, it's even religion, culture, the, the uh, political institutions and what have it that respond to that economic base, which is why White people say, act, and all of the institutions do what they do because they have an economic base made of slavery and colonialism. That's why you will never go to a situation where people practice slavery and they will teach in their schools freedom. Not real freedom. You know, uh, uh, socialism based on capitalism because the, the ideology, the institutions, the legal institutions, political institutions, are a superstructure that rests upon a base of colonialism and slavery. And that's what informs the practice and activities of white people. To the extent that they are proud of it often. Think about the greatest, the greatest civilization that you can think about that white people boast about. Their empire, the Roman Empire, the Greek Empire. All these empires. And empires are entities that live of other, you know, peoples and groups and stuff like that. And this is the contradiction that they have. And you know, you 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 know you recently hear about the serial killer, the you know, the the lone person who didn't hang out with anybody, but that's the that's the definition of the American hero. <laughs> that's the definition of the, the loner, the lone uh, person, you know. Uh, and, and, and all of the serial killers act just like John Wayne, you know, or Ronald Wilson Craig, or the rest of them. I talk, I only talk to sister. Go ahead, sister. Oh, where are you going to? Mm -hmm. Who are you? Uh, first, I want to thank you for being here and just passing this knowledge. I really appreciate it. You're very um, My question is you gave us the tools of. is how do you activate your community members to first even want to receive that knowledge and then motivate them to want to be a part of it and make it happen? And then lastly, how do you connect them to their true homeland of Africa? Because I've had so many conversations with Africans born in America or even in the Caribbean where my family comes from who will literally say, I am not African, I'm this, or I'm that, or I'm American, or I'm black. Yeah. You know, I mean, like, this mind is black, I'm yeah. not black. You know, so, like, how do you connect them to who they are and have them understand the knowledge and want it? How, how, do, you, how do you start with that movement? First of all, yeah. we, first of all, the first thing we acknowledge is that if we can understand Anybody can understand it. Because ain't that, that damn special about me, right? Or you. So if we get it, other people can get it too. I think that's the starting point. I think beyond that, we have to really realize that African people are humans and Africans do want to be free. It's just not well defined often, and just not, there's not often the leadership on the ground that helps people to see how to get there. That's why the government destroys organizations, personalities, and stuff like that that were trying to provide leadership. That's why Malcolm is there, that's why King is there, that's why Huey is there, that's why, you know, uh, members of the Black Panther Party are dead because they do not want us to have that. And, and what has happened is that what poses as leadership for us that's in the city council and in some of these other institutions, et cetera, they have no, no relationship to the masses of our people uh, who are living in these 
you know, the real circumstances. What happens also is that a false national consciousness has been imposed on us. But it's not, it's not there all the time. Because you gotta remember, Marcus Garvey led a movement of millions of African people stretched across the globe. And their slogan was Africa for Africa, those at home and those abroad. And when they say Africa for Africa, at home, they were talking about Africa and those abroad, they were talking about people who were in Oakland and in Australia and all those other places. Then you gotta remember too, as recent as the 1960s, one of the reasons this is a reference point is we saw huge mobilizations of black people who were actually in war uh, with the system and who were gunned down, killed, that's why crack cocaine, all these other things that will erase the memory, and that's why you can't even find a legitimate history of that of that time right now. Listen, we have not movement hasn't recovered from that more than two generations. There have been more than two generations of African people who heard nothing about revolution, who know nothing about it, who will be sucked into a damn movie about an imaginary place that doesn't exist that's going to be what it is because of a superhero. It's an, it's an attack on organization, it's an attack on the reality of what Africa is and what's going to take to make us free. But guess what? You and I in this room right now having this discussion and we're going to do it despite all those things that attack the consciousness of our people all the time. Let me tell you this. I am a materialist. I'm a philosophical materialist, not the dollar. I'm a philosophical materialist. And, you know, there's, there are philosophical idealists who can't deal with the real world like it is. And we can't be free unless we look at the world like it really is, not just like we want it to be. And if we were going to be trapped in this room, perhaps for a long period of time and couldn't get out, and all of our environment, this was our environment, and somebody's running around saying that this podium is a car. Well, I know this is not a car. And I'm going to debate the person. I'm going to debate it not because of me, or even because of that person, but because of you. Because if you think this is a car, when the police kicks this door down and you try to get away, you hop on here and try to drive, you're in big time trouble. And the reason I'm mentioning this is because as a materialist, I know that despite the illusions that are pumped into the heads of black people, there's a material reality that we have to live with every day. And that material reality kicks us in the teeth, it kills our children in playgrounds with play guns, it chokes us out on the streets in broad daylight for selling a cigarette. This is the reality that can constantly attacks us. And it gives people like you and I, because we come together, while others have not yet done it, we come together because we have a common understanding that this is the reality that we're confronted with. And then we say, how do we get to the rest of the people? Can we have a demonstration? Can we do this and that? Because many people think the same thing you think, but we have to give them permission to say that. I believe that too. We have to give them an opportunity to join a demonstration to be able to fight back. That's what our demonstrations are about and things like that. More than it is going up against an opponent, is telling all the other people that you have permission to be against this oppression. You can stand up with us and take this stand. That's, that's what it's about. That's how we begin to organize. This is going up with the Brandon Spear newspaper. You, we have to come into an organization. That's the critical thing that we have to do first. Uhuru, and I, I know I've talked too long. And uh, I want to, I really uh, appreciate, nobody's thrown anything at me yet. <laughs> And I know I've kept you here for a very long time. And I'm, I'm really apologetic because when this happened, then you were reluctant to come back the next time. <laughs> uh, but I do hope uh, tomorrow there's an event at 4 o'clock. And we're going to talk about um, this whole counterinsurgency of the war that this government has made against our people and our movement. Um, so that we won't fight for our freedom. And of course it happened in the 1960s because of crisis. And we see deepening crisis happening here. And we see evidence that the government is moving similarly today than it did in the 1960s. So we want to talk about that. And I hope that you will come out and tell other people about this. And I just again want to express so much appreciation. I hope you will go. 
uh, what is it, Black Power Blueprint? You carrying that com? You carrying that com slash Black Power Blueprint. And somebody said something about uh, Facebook too? Facebook and YouTube, Black Power Blueprint. So please check that out. I think you would like that. And it shows how we can win. And because uh, as quiet as it's kept, the struggle is not about AK-47s most of the time. That's the easy part of the struggle. The hard part is when you have power, what to do with it. And we're preparing to govern every day. That's what we're doing. Y'all are stuff we're preparing to govern. Our objective is to get power, not to tell a white man how much we dislike him. I don't give a damn whether the white man thinks I like him or not. The question is having power. That's what colonized people have to do. And so that's what we do. We're preparing to go. And you're on the right track if you come into this movement because that's what we're about. And, um, you know, when the Bolsheviks took power, I mentioned them, in 1917, uh, first of all, they didn't even know if they were going to be able to hold power. They would sit up in meetings in this little tiny room after they got the whole damn government. Uh, sitting on their suitcases wearing overcoats because they didn't know if they were going to be thrown out any moment. And they didn't have any money. They made the revolution. They are the government. And they went to the bank. They sent it out to the bank. And the bank wouldn't give them any money because the bank didn't unite with the revolution. And the bank wouldn't give them any money and they didn't know how to run the bank. So they ended up having to send somebody over there to rob the bank to get money to run the government. So what we're saying is that we come into power, we're going to know how to run the banks. And that's what it is that we're involved in now with this process here. This, this is the hard part. We're doing the hard part first. Setting up infrastructure, creating an actual capacity, training people who are ordinary working class people to assume our responsibilities of leading institutions and things like that, and building institutions, and then winning allies uh, like yourselves uh, to participate in this process. That's what the reparations is, no damn charity. We're saying that we need these resources back so that we can be able to, we are constructing the future in St. Louis. We are constructing the future in Occupy Zania or South Africa. Everywhere we are, that's what we're doing. Ours is a real movement. It is, we are practical revolutionaries. When we say reparations, we want reparations. We don't just wait for Jesus or the government to give it or some major corporation. We're making reparations happen now. That's in the room that you're in. So say, I don't trust white people. I don't blame you for not trusting white people because they ain't giving us our stuff back yet. But now we got a whole process of returning our stuff to us, and I like that. You know, uh, so if a man gets robbed, it's not going to be me who do that. <laughs> <laughs> if you know what I mean, gentlemen. So, so, uh, so we're building the future right now as we have this discussion. And we calling you to join us in this process. I want to thank you so much uh, for coming out. And I want to thank uh, so many of you, many of you I've known for a very long time as a part of this movement. Uh, some uh, as dearest comrades and allies, uh, I've learned so much um, from, the, from Union de Barrio. I thought I knew some things about it, but to be down uh, in Southern California and to see as I've been, and to see uh, Mexican workers at the end of the day going uh, into the hills where they sleep in caves with bag, luckies, plastic bags of luckies. I don't get plastic bags anymore. You have to buy them, don't you? Yeah, let's see. That's, that's the way it is. Now we fight for a clean environment. So now I guess they have paper bags uh, that they carry. Uh, their food and what have you up into the hills where they sleep in caves while they're producing all of the food and what have you that grace the tables of people in California. And I've learned so much. Uh, and I like the situation and I hope I don't sound presumptuous and really bad, but I like it because Mexicans are cool too. Because anybody who can make <laughs> war happen out of your area. Isn't that where war comes from? Yeah. Say, Cisco kid. Yeah. He was a friend of mine. <laughs> uh, uh, it's just cool. I see so much cultural affinity 
But more than that, if you know your history well enough, you also know that our relationship is more than just culture. It is biological. It is a physical relationship. It is the relationship between Africans and the indigenous peoples of this land is very real, you know. Uh, so uh, I just want to thank you again, and let's make this revolution. Let's let's get free. I'm tired of this stuff. I don't want to have to live a life where there might be another Trump or another uh, Bush or another Hillary or another Obama or any of these clowns that works uh, against our interests. We can have a different kind of world, and I think we deserve it, and uh, we have to fight for it. So thank you very much, sisters and brothers.